kind of excited about. Uh, matter of fact, I wrote a pastor's pondering this afternoon. You'll you'll see it Friday. If if you if you read the E Beacon, uh, you'll you'll see it. Uh, and I, I I mentioned about getting back into a routine, and I'm kind of, I'm a routine kind of guy. I, I tend to tend to uh, do better when there's a routine to life. And that doesn't mean I, I get boring because life itself doesn't get boring. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of ready for the routine to get back in. That first week of January brings us into routine again. So um, I, I, this week and next week, we're going to be having kind of an individual Bible study uh, that really isn't connected to any other thing that we're doing. And then the, the, on the uh, 19th, the third week, is going to be our annual meeting. And then the week after that, 26, we're going to be starting a new study. Uh, that's going to, we'll be in it for a while. And it's on the life of Jacob. And I've always found Jacob just a fascinating person, uh, personality, because sometimes you read through his story in Genesis and you're thinking to yourself, wow, God called him. I mean, this guy's, he's a sneak and a deceiver and, and uh, gives us all hope, right? Uh, so I'm giving you a couple of weeks head notice. You might you might go ahead and, and start reading about the life of Jacob. This Sunday, we're going to return to the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm very excited about that. Um, so we've got about 10 more weeks to come uh, on Sunday mornings in the Sermon on the Mount. So you can be, that kind of lets you know where we're going to be going, to be going along the way. Tonight... I want you to turn to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. An absolutely beautiful psalm. There's a couple of verses in it that I that I refer to quite often in preaching, especially as it relates to the forgiveness of God. But I want us to take a little time tonight and look at the overall picture of the psalm. It is a psalm of David. Uh, it's one that, that you, you may be very familiar with. Uh, maybe for a few of you, this, this will be an introduction to it. Um, but let me, let me just start by reading the first, I want to read the first couple of verses. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, all, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Now, what's interesting about this psalm, one of the things, is that it's beautifully put together. The first couple of verses are the encouragement to praise um, from the individual level, to praise the Lord. And, and we're going to take a look at, in a moment at all these benefits. Uh, but I want you to be thinking, as I'm talking even for a minute, when he says, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, Praise his holy name. I want you to be thinking, what does that look like? To praise with our inmost being. Uh, and then, so the first two verses are the call to praise. If you go to the last few verses, verse 20, it ends up with, with the theme of praise. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. So it's, it's, it begins with a call to praise, and it's, it's the individual call to lift up our praise with all of our being to the Lord. And it ends with this, this magnificent image of all of creation and all of created beings lifting up praise to the Lord. And in between, it's all about why. It's all about why we can lift up our praise to the Lord. Any thought when he says, praise the Lord, O my soul, O my inmost being, praise his holy name. Any thought about, in your mind, what that looks like and how that's demonstrated? Gates 
all that is within me. Okay. That's easier for me to understand than okay. what did you say? Inmost all my inmost being. All that is within me. Okay. I like that. So is that what how how does that happen? In your life, how does that happen? Joy. There's a sense of, of the joy that's the fruit of the spirit that comes in us as as we relate to the Lord and are in relationship to Him. I always pray to ask the Lord to guard my my mouth, my eyes, my ears, my speech, every every thought that I have to guard that. Okay, that that and in our prayer life that we're asking that everything about us will reflect him. Pleasing to him, yes. Right. Pleasing to him, our yes. speech, our attitudes, our reactions, our actions. Kind of the, the song we sang at the end of uh, the worship service on Sunday morning at 11, Christ be all around me. Uh, any other thought? Because one of the first things that jumps to my mind is our worship. When we gather together corporately that, that we are together praising God with with everything that we have at least that's the image that's that's the, the hope I picture that when when I, I'm, I'm simply that kind of praise can happen anytime anywhere you know in your favorite place out in the woods or walking along the beach or sitting on your deck or walking down the street and you're just you're praying you're 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 just trying to to connect and relate to the Lord. Um, I didn't even go outside today. I was I, but I was I was standing by in in our dining room, just standing by the window, looking out, and the sky was magnificent today. It was beautiful today, and to to recognize that, to see that, to acknowledge that. Any other thoughts? I don't think it comes naturally. I mean, I think you have to decide to let. I think most of the time, yeah, we have to make a very conscious decision that we are turning our focus to the Lord. Very much so. Okay. So he says in verse 2, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then he goes on and tells us about those benefits in 3 through 5. Who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Do you hear all those words that describe the benefits? Forgives, heals, redeems, crowns, satisfies. That's worth thinking about for a few minutes, isn't it? Redeems all our sins or forgives all of our sins. Praise God, right? That forgiveness is there for us. Where would we be without that forgiveness? Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. That literally could be translated, redeems your life from the grave. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? It's interesting that David's writing that. <coughs> you and I tend to think about that from, from the aspect of post-resurrection. But David's a thousand years before the earthly ministry of Jesus. And there's a real strong belief and faith that, that this life isn't all there is as, as, as one who is relating to God and connected to him. How about crowns your love, your you with love and compassion? Any? How does that strike you, or any thought come to you about that? 
How does he crown you with love and compassion? Well, I think about um, he realizes that we're so weak <laughs> and pitiful. <laughs> and he, he's going to get into that more later on, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and he loves us, even though, and he crowns us with his glory and grace. And when you were speaking of being on your deck or looking mm -hmm. out, Keith and I were walking on the Greenbrier River Trail during uh, Christmas break, and we were walking, and it's beautiful there. The Greenbrier River's there, the mountains, I mean, it's just gorgeous. And these two people ran by us jogging, you know, and they ran by and they said, have you seen anything? And I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because Keith had his camera, and um, I said, God's beauty. You know, and they laughed, you know, they laughed at me. But we what were in I this do? most beautiful, and they asked me if we'd seen anything. <laughs> I was just like. Uh, when, 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 you, when you open up your eyes and look around you, yeah. there's, just, there's so much to see. Yeah. Yeah. How good God is to us. And, and he's going to talk about the fact of our frailty, our human frailty. Uh, a little later on in the in the song, um, you know, when I think about a crown. I, I think about something that that sits on the head, that uh, is symbolic of royalty, and it's like He bestows that upon us through His love and His compassion for us, and that's a, that is a theme of this song all the way along. Any other thought about that? Crowns you with love and compassion. I think that singer singles us out individually so that he knows he is speaking and working with us. His love and compassion is, it reaches to the world as a whole, but it is individual. It reaches to the individual. Christ died for you. He died for me die for all of us. But he loves us and knows us inside out. He makes us part of his kingdom too, I guess, when you, when you think about it. Absolutely. The king invites us into his kingdom, doesn't he? Yeah. Connecting the concept of crown. Tom? Reminds me of that uh, chapter in Isaiah where they say it mounts up with wings as eagles. You know, very It is, and, and you know, if you read that entire psalm, Psalm 40, of, I mean, not Psalm, Isaiah 40 is, is a beautiful passage of Scripture. It's the very first chapter of what is considered Book 2 in the book of Isaiah. Book 2 is a book of comfort. And, and if you read the first 39 chapters in Isaiah, it, you get pretty worn out because it's, it's, it's God explaining through the prophet why judgment is falling. But he gets to chapter 40 and he turns a corner and uh, he talks about comforting his people. He talks about uh, preparing the way, the ministry of John the Baptist. And, and he goes on and, and, and uh, it gets into a lot of, as a matter of fact, we'll probably take a peek at it, a lot of our own human frailty. And yet in him, how he mounts us up with wings as eagles. Absolutely. Isaiah 40 is a wonderful chapter. Okay. <coughs> Who satisfies your desires with good things. Do you find that true for your life? And if so, how do you see that as true? How have you found that to be true? Satisfies your desires. What's the new King James have in... Uh, the first part of verse 5. Your mouth. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. Who satisfies what? Your mouth. My mouth. Which I think is, I love my sound the same as what you said. Okay, give me another translation. I'm, I'm from the NIV. Fills your life with blessings. Fills your life with blessings. Satisfies you with good. Satisfies you with good. Okay. i got to work on that one. 
Read well, that. I read, do like food. Read so. that. Yeah. <laughs> well, read that again to me. This is the New King James, right? Yeah, it is. Okay, and that's it says he satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is re renewed <clears throat> like the eagles. Okay. What what verse is it? You said five, didn't you? Yes, verse five. Yeah. Okay. Okay. See, uh, and, did somebody say he fills my life with good things? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good things with blessings satisfies your desires. Um, let's go with with brings to your life good things, satisfies your inmost or your your uh, your desires with good things. How do you find that to be true? Anybody want to testify to that? Well, I have to say something. This is really strange, and and, and but when you even when we were praying, I was thanking the Lord for my toilet. Because I have waited for so for the room visit four months for a new toilet. Okay. There. <laughs> Amen, <And> sister. <laughs> We're with you. Really We're it. with you. I, I got you. I got you. You know, if, if when you go on the mission field, some many, many, most mission fields, probably anywhere outside of the Western world, uh, you appreciate your toilet at home. You very much do because. It's very different, okay? I won't get into details, but it's very different. It's like you're out on the Greenbrier Trail. There you, yeah, there you go. There you go. How about somebody else? Satisfies your desires with good things. But it's not always what you think is a No, it's not always what you anticipate or even what you desire. But every one of us woke up this morning. Every one of us has another day, right? Um you know, when I, when I hear that verse and I think about that, I'm thinking about the inmost desires. I'm thinking about the desires that are deepest within us, that go far beyond stuff, far beyond circumstances. I'm, I'm thinking about the desires, the, 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 the needs we have to be, to be loved, to have an object of love, to have a genuine relationship, to have purpose and meaning and uh, I mean, to, to walk with the, the one who made us. I mean, those are the deepest desires of our lives. And, and he meets those. And I just said, well, I'm thinking to know him better is one of the, the, the great desires that I have. Absolutely. To know him better. Okay. So that, as Tom pointed out, your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The psalmist goes on and says, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. I was thinking about that. All the times I've read this, this psalm and, and, and looked at it, I probably haven't landed on that verse very often for some reason. I couldn't tell you why. It, it sort of is there. And then more, more of the theme rolls along in, in a moment. But the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. And my first thought was, my goodness, that's hard to see in this world sometimes. It's very hard to see. But then, then I started thinking about David. What did he see in his lifetime that said the, work, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed? Because uh, that's a loaded question when it comes to David's life. And, you know, first thing that jumps to my mind is how he was on the run from King Saul all for, for a long time. And Saul, and, and God protected him from Saul. And God dealt with Saul. Uh, I'm, I'm sure in David's mind, he's thinking back to how God led the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt delivered them through Moses. But I also couldn't help but stop and think. And, and there's debate about when this psalm was written. But, but I couldn't help but stop and think. He himself was the oppressor. When it came to Bathsheba and it came to Uriah. And, uh, you know, when he wrote that, when he wrote this psalm, was he writing it? I would like to think 
But this is the culmination of Psalm 32, 51, and it wraps up with 103. I can't prove that. But Psalm 32 is very raw. Psalm 51, in terms of repentance and realizing sin and confessing. And Psalm 51 sounds like somebody who has found that forgiveness. This sounds like somebody even further down the road. But I don't know. And, and as, I, as I read you know, about his life in, in 2 Samuel, I'm, I'm, I'm left with that question. Right? Because his life's very tragic after what happened with Bathsheba and Uriah. And uh, God holds him accountable, brings accountability to him. Um, what first comes to my mind is I think about Joseph when I read this, yeah. this verse. Yeah. How unfairly he was treated. Yeah. And how God worked in all of that to bring his purposes about. That David was quite possibly thinking about Moses is, is mentioned in the very next verse. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. Steve? Uh, I was just going to say, David is a pretty hardcore fellow. I mean, this guy, he he's blood and guts. I mean, he's like Pat. Uh, but for him to have the insight and spiritual insight to be able to write these things, shows a different side of him, a side of him that was uh, very conscious of God mm -hmm. and very conscious of what he was doing. Yeah, David slipped up, he made some bad mistakes, but he's a man after God's own heart. And, you know, he I guess what I'm trying to say is that he wasn't a lily liver person. He was a person that, that would stand up and get things done, but he'd also break down in these psalms you know, and, and show a spirituality that probably wasn't prevalent at that time. David was very multifaceted. I mean, anybody that can take a harp and play it to calm and soothe a king, you know, who was, uh, but he, but also one of the reasons God told him he wasn't going to build the temple was because he was a man of war. And, uh, and yeah, the, the blood that, that was that was shed that hit that his hand. Um, yeah. David's a fascinating character to, to study, and and one that you know seems like almost every character in the scriptures that you look upon and, and that you read about. You're left scratching your head sometimes. We're going to look at Jacob. And Jacob is, is one of my least favorite mm -hmm. uh, characters in the scriptures. And I guess that's maybe one reason I'm being led to go there because I'm, I'm, I'm still uh, looking for some redeeming qualities in him. And, and, uh, and yet, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes. Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Uh, this God had his hand on this guy. Uh, and, I, and I guess I'm always reminded, and, and what comes through in this psalm to me, especially as we keep going, is the grace of God. The mercy of God. Undeserved grace that is there. Um, let's, let's go ahead and, and look Three verses 8 through 12. By the way, I don't think I mentioned this. This is one of the Psalms where, again, as, a, as sort of a guideline in writing, every letter of the Hebrew alphabet is used beginning each verse. I mean, I mean the, he goes right down the Hebrew alphabet each verse using the next letter as the key word uh, starting off, which, which that's, uh, kind of, Steve, that's kind of what you're talking about, that, that there's a lot to David. Well, let's look at verses 8 through 12. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Those are beautiful, beautiful concepts. They're beautiful truths uh, for who God is, a picture of who God is. Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. You know, there are examples in Scripture we can see where that, that patience wasn't there for some folks. It was immediate judgment. But by and large, there's tremendous patience. I mean, how long he put up with, with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament before he finally sent the ultimate judgment upon Jerusalem and, and destroyed the temple, sent his people into exile. But I think about our lives. I, I think most of us can speak to the patience of God, the slow to anger, um, that, he's, that he's gracious to us, um, especially when we deal with habitual sin. Sin that, that has a hold in our lives and, and we struggle with it. We pray about it. We promise God we're never going to do it again, whatever that sin might be. And lo and behold, it comes back around again. So I think we know his compassion, his, his slowness to anger. Um, I've always been taken by verse 10. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Again, depending, I don't know when he wrote this, but certainly David found that to be true. Whether he wrote this before all that happened in his life or after the fact. But what comes to my mind is that ultimately, <coughs> how God chooses to deal with our sin is in Christ. And that's certainly not treating us as our sins deserve or repaying us according to our iniquities because that in itself would call for the judgment of God and eternal separation to be, to be forever parted from him. But he didn't want that. No, no. His, his love for us is, is what sent his son. His compassion, his, his grace is what sent his son. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. I mean, none of us will be in relationship with him otherwise. I think as I was thinking about verse 11, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. I think that's when I was today looking out, <laughs> just looking at the sky. Uh, just, just trying to wrap my mind around his love for us and the depth of it. A couple of different times, and this is the first time it talks about his, his love for those who fear him. And we've talked about fear before and, and what that looks like. Um, there is, the, there is a sense that, and, and you see it in the apostles, you, you see it all the way throughout scripture when somebody realizes they're in the presence of God, they drop. They drop to their face. They drop face down because they realize who they are in the presence of, of the holy, in the presence of, of the sinless. Um, and yet, you talk about slow to anger and abounding in love, there's Jesus reaching down and, and saying, don't be afraid. You know, picking us up. There's a legitimate fear. A fear of one who holds the power of, of death uh, for our lives. Not just physical, but spiritual death. There's a fear that calls for reverence of, of acknowledging who he is and who we are in comparison an awe of who he is. And sometimes I, I think a challenge to the church in the West 
right now is that we lose that reverence. We lose that awe of him. We kind of see him as our buddy and want to throw our arm around him and 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 got to be cautious about that because of who he is. You know, he calls us friend. We are we are his children through Christ. Any thought about all this? Steve? You know, it's uh, heard, heard people say, praise God. You know, I'm not saying anything wrong with that, but it's like, okay, go ahead. You know, praise God is not praising God. David said praise God. He knows how to do it. We should think these things. I, I should think these things. Everybody else probably is exempt from it. But it's like just to actually praise him. Uh, I was laying in bed one night, really couldn't sleep. So I just closed my eyes and just started thanking God and praising him for everything that he's done that's good for me and good for the world. And no, I got, next thing I know, I'm in dreamland. <laughs> there you, know, you go. It, sure. it relaxed me and put sure. me to sleep. But I, I was I was thinking uh, that verse 13 is me. But uh, I was thinking that whenever people say, well, well, well praise God, well, we should, I should have a praise that I could say, you know, wonderful is he. Yeah. Wonderful is he our maker. Who, who what us, what I'm hearing life. you what I'm hearing you say is we, we we may need to be more cognizant or aware of spiritual terms that we use mm -hmm. without really maybe meaning them with the depth they need to be used with. Is that pretty accurate? Um, yes. Yeah, it says right. put the mayonnaise on top of the sandwich, put it all the way through the sandwich. Ugh. I know. That's a bad analogy. <laughs> you can keep all the mayonnaise. <laughs> Let's try another one. No, you're good. Put you're honey, good. honey on top of it. There you go. Uh, as far but, as fear, it'd be like your earthly father, you know. I was always, I love my father and he was kind to me but uh, he always had that mm -hmm. fear that you didn't want to a very healthy respect you didn't yes. want to cross the line right didn't want to cross the line yeah. and with God sometimes I feel I'm not worthy sure because you know I'm just me we don't want to disappoint right and, you know, after all he's done for us right after all all the love he's shown us we don't want to disappoint And, and, and uh, yeah, I think I heard kind of a, a universal, we aren't, right? One of the things I hear when we ask someone to be a deacon or, or somebody feels called by God to go into a vocation of ministry, I'm not worthy. And you're right. None of us. None of us are. It's, it's something that, um, it's, it's just, again, the grace of God that gives those opportunities as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Forgiveness is such a theme, and it's such a message that the church has got to keep sending to the world. Um, well, some of you want to look up some scriptures or, and like and, and just read them out for me real loud. Uh, somebody want to look up Isaiah one eighteen. Isaiah 1, 18. Julie? Uh, Isaiah 38, 17. Eric? Uh, Jeremiah 31, 34. Ed? What was that again? Jeremiah 31, 34. Tom, did I see you raise your hand back there? Would you look up Micah? Seven verses eighteen and nineteen. Micah seven verses eighteen and nineteen. And then one more. 
First John, this one I'll be real familiar. Brandon, First John 4, 9 and 10. And, and I just kind of want us to hear this kind of this waterfall of, of passages, scriptures that, that remind us of the theme of forgiveness throughout scripture. Um, Isaiah 1, 18. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They are, though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Great. Thirty-eight, seventeen. Yes, this anguish was good for me, for you have rescued me from death and forgiven all my sins. Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-four. No longer will each person teach his neighbors or his relatives by saying, "Know the Lord." <coughs> all of them, from the least important to the most important, will know me, declares the Lord. Because I will forgive their wickedness, and I will no longer hold their sins against them. Micah 7, 18 and 19. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Okay. In First John 4. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we may live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Okay. You can almost add the vast majority of the book of Hebrews from about Hebrews 7 on. Uh, Romans, you could get into that as well. I mean, it, all of Paul's writings, there's just this overwhelming message from the prophets through uh, and the Psalms all the way through uh, the ministry of Christ and, and the church to follow about forgiveness and a forgiveness that removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. I mean, that's, that's as far... I was like that casting crown song that, that kind of took that verse and and and, and ran with it. Um, and I guess what that says to me is that God is is very willing and through through what Christ has accomplished to forgive us of our sins and does when we repent and, and confess and ask ask for forgiveness uh, the importance on our part of letting go of it the importance on our part of of moving forward and, and forgiving ourselves um, not an easy thing to do but I guess I, I ultimately come down to this. If God forgives me, then I can forgive myself. If he's removed it as far as the east is from the west, then I can let go of it. Because if you don't, you can't move forward. It, very, yeah, very hard. Your, your progress is going to be stunted. You can't share his love with others. And that may be one of the very top messages of the church. Uh, I still think about a fellow, when I was in seminaries, uh, he was over the Cleveland Psychiatric Institute, his name was Irving Rosen, and I've, I've shared this before, but I'll never forget, he came in and talked to this, this group of, of seminary, uh, seminarians that, that, that were very concerned about the whole idea of mental health in the church, and uh, this was a this was a man who was Jewish culturally, but not in in personal faith, and he pretty much says that right out front. But he said to us, he said, if the church was doing its job, this place would be empty, and I've never forgotten that because. One of the things that so many people were struggling with in that mental institution was guilt. 
guilt that just was very overriding. And uh, that, that's, that has stuck with me for all these years. And the enemy will use that. Oh, no doubt. Against you. The enemy will say to every one of us, he cannot forgive you. He might forgive old so-and-so, and you've gone too far. You've gone to a place, look, forget it. And he, and he says that to people all the time. Um, so if you happen to be here tonight, or if you happen to be someone who's streaming with us, and you're holding on to to something you've done in the past and believe that God cannot forgive you, that is not biblical. It is not scriptural. Uh, and, and he gives us tremendous examples of that. Kind of talked about him Sunday morning. Um, well, let's, let's kind of keep, keep rolling here. Verse, let's go to verses 13 through 18. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and in its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his, his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. There's a real contrast going on here. A contrast between who we are as human beings and who God is as the eternal creator. I mean, it, it kind of explains why we ought to have a very healthy respect, reverence, and awe for him because of who we are compared to who he is. There is a theme all the way through scriptures. And we really don't have time, but I'm going to mention some scriptures that you might look at on your own. Uh, the idea that as, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it. It's gone. Its place remembers it no more. That is a very humbling realization. And it's a very healthy realization for, for any of us to grab hold of. Our life on this earth isn't forever. Our life on this earth is very fleeting. Uh, as a matter of fact, Psalm, Psalm 90 is a psalm you can go to. Psalm 90, 4 through 6 uh, talks about that very thing. That it, 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 it mentions the idea that, well, you know, we have 70 years or 80 if we have the strength, yet they quickly pass and fly away. I refer to that often in, in funerals that I, that I do. James 4, 14 compares us to a mist, a vapor. That's here, to, that's here and gone very briefly. Isaiah 40, that's that, there's that psalm again, <clears throat> really uh, pretty much sounds like this passage. It, it talks about us, uh, flowers of the field, and, and uh, just very brief in our, in our earthly existence. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it's 1 Peter that quotes Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8. You often double check me on that. Uh, but there's a, that's a theme all the way throughout. Ecclesiastes brings that theme out. It is, it is very humbling and very sobering to, under, to, to realize that. It, 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 if, if you go too far with it, it takes you to a point where you wonder what good and possible good can I do. But if you have a healthy perspective on it, it takes you to uh, verse 17, from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. Which, you know, that, that concept of, of what we do impacts the generations to come. So, you know, I, I think about how often has Billy Graham thought about now? Now, he hasn't been gone that long. People still talk about Billy Graham, and then they say, you know, there's nobody like Billy Graham, and that's typically the conversation that goes. 
But he had a large imprint on this world, impact. And he's gone. And yet that impact continues on from all the lives that have been touched and all the lives that pass along the truth of the gospel. And none of us have a Billy Graham kind of impact, but every one of us can leave a strong imprint on the lives of others. Hey, let's be honest. You know, I mean, when you're gone, you're, you're only going to be remembered for a little while. Uh, we're, you know, but, but what you've done carries on. in the lives of people that you have had an influence on or touched. And, and that's, that's what we, that's really what it's all about. Ultimately, right? I know we could have a great big long conversation on that, but I'm gonna, I wanna finish with this, okay? The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. A powerful statement of the sovereignty of God. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. We aren't going to take time to do it, but if you're wondering who the heavenly host is, it's those gathered around the throne of God. And you can, you can check it out in 1 Kings 22, verse 19. 1 Kings 22, verse 19. Praise the Lord. All his works everywhere in his dominion. How many psalms we read that, that, that cry out for creation itself to praise God. To, to witness to the truth of God. And what you were talking about walking along the Greenbrier River Trail. Creation is praising God, pointing to him, everything about it. I find this a very encouraging psalm because it is a psalm of praise. And that's, that's where we can live our lives, day by day. That's a great, great attitude to have as we're walking through this year. Right? There is a lot more we can talk about there, but... We're, we're out of time, and as we go to prayer, I want you to be praying for our choir, and I want you to be praying for Rick Tolbert. Mm -hmm. Rick's going to be an interim choir director until we have uh, our new, uh, when God decides to bring along our, our new uh, director. Uh, but I also want you to be praying because next Thursday, we're going to have a very important interview. And... Uh, Let's put it this way. I'm, I'm at a point where with this particular person we're going to be talking with that God's going to have to show me very clearly this isn't the right person. Because right now I see a lot of things that might indicate that he is. Uh, which I saw that once before early in this process and that guy just blew the smithereens right off the bat. God, God shut that door really tight. And that's what I'm praying. That's what our search team's praying. If this isn't right, slam it tight. Because I sure don't want to walk through the wrong door. Steve? Uh, are you sure we can't go any longer? Your voice sounds fine. Uh, <laughs> we've got people who need to get to choir. Uh, there's, there's things that need to happen. Jan? Good to see you back. You doing okay now? Yes. Good. Good to see you back. Would you all stand? Let's pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time. I thank you for your words. Uh, Lord, it's, it's truth for us. I thank you that it speaks to us in so many different ways, even from one passage. That's so exciting. We're very grateful. Lord, it seems that if we take even a couple of moments that we find our, our hearts overflowing and our minds filled with praise for you. Help us to, to move day to day 
in a spirit of praise and thanksgiving, an awareness of your presence, your goodness, and your touch upon us. I do lift up Rick, I lift up the choir tonight as, as they practice, and I pray you your blessing upon their time, that it's a, a wonderful time together. And I do lift up our search team. I lift up the young man we're going to be talking with. God, we want your perfect will for him, for us. And we ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.